Dead America, El Paso, Creeping Death, Part 3. Dead America, The Second Month. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1 As the sun rose over the town of Fabens, the weary group began to stir. Rufus emerged from the bedroom, rubbing his eyes, wincing at his stiff muscles protesting from their busy day in Fort Stockton. Sparks threw open the curtains, and he groaned when the bright light blinded him. Okay, okay, I'm awake, he moaned. You ain't gotta torture me, girl. She whipped around at his belly aching and smirked, walking over and patting his shoulder. Sorry, she said. Probably not the flashing you were hoping for this morning. His eyes finally focused, and he looked down at her, a sly grin erupting across his face. Well, now, I'm really awake, he drawled. At his wink, the red head rolled her eyes. Jeff lumbered out of his room, fists screwed into his eyes in nothing but his boxes. Sparks clapped a hand over her eyes with feigned repulsion. Good thing I already blinded you, Rufus, she said. No kidding, the old man added pretending to gag. "'Fuck, I'm tired,' Jeff mumbled, voice hoarse. "'Apparently so,' Sparks replied, "'since you forgot to put on pants this morning.' The skinhead looked down at himself, shaking his head and then shrugging. "'Well, with any luck this will be the worst sight you see today.' "'Not likely,' Rufus said with a sigh, turning towards the kitchen. "'Shit, man, don't tell me I have to be the optimistic one today.' Jeff groaned, throwing his hands up. Sparks rummaged around in one of the cupboards. Don't worry, I'm sure we can pawn that duty off on Leon, she quipped. Besides, Rufus is right, this is going to be another long day. What the hell are we going out there for again? Jeff groaned, plonking himself down into a nearby armchair. I thought our next choke point was Van Horn, and that's not for a couple of days yet. Sparks shook her head as she found an ancient jar of instant coffee and shoved it right back into the cupboard. "'There's one more highway to the north of Fort Davis,' she explained, shutting the cupboard. "'Not only do we need to thin them out as much as possible, we have to make sure they don't go into Fort Davis.' "'Pretty sure those guys can handle themselves, just saying,' Jeff said, raising his palms in surrender. "'Well, if you don't feel like going out today, you can stay back and help me set up that humdinger,' Rufus offered, patting his chest. So you'd get to spend the whole day side by side with me, and a few hundred pounds of explosive, toxic chemicals. Jeff rubbed his forehead and then let out a long, defeated sigh. Fine, I'll go fight zombies, he groaned. Sparks chuckled. Don't worry, buddy. I'm sure we can get some breakfast before kicking the day off, she said. That's something, at least, Jeff muttered. A high-pitched whizzing sound in the distance echoed outside, and the trio exchanged confused glances. "'Anybody else hear that?' Rufus asked. They stood silently for a moment, listening hard as the sound grew louder and louder. "'What the hell is that?' Jeff demanded, getting to his feet. Sparks headed for the door. "'It sounds like a drone,' she said over her shoulder. The trio piled outside and looked up finally finding an aircraft hovering several feet above the town. Leon exited his house a few doors down, wandering up the road with his hand over his eyes, squinting. "'Hey, is that one of yours?' Rufus asked, turning to him. Leon shook his head. "'Nope,' he replied. "'No clue who that belongs to.' "'Don't tell me the cartel is spying on us,' Jeff grumbled. Leon shrugged. "'Not sure why they'd have to, since a couple of them are still in town.' he said. The device flew past them, heading towards the command center before descending rapidly. "'Let's get over there,' Leon said, waving for them to follow. As they turned to leave, Rufus turned and stopped Jeff, pointing to his lower half. "'You forgetting something?' he asked. "'Pretty sure Ethel will cut you for showing up like that.' Jeff looked down again and chuckled, shaking his head. "'I'll be there in a few,' he promised, and darted back into the house. Rufus caught up to Sparks and Leon, the three of them racing over to the command center. Trenton and Clara stood outside, looking up at the roof of the building. "'Did you guys see the drone?' Leon huffed as they reached them. 
Clara nodded. Yeah, it landed on the roof, she explained. Well, anybody got a ladder? Rufus demanded. Leon shook his head, walking over to the wall. He braced himself against the brick, standing stiffly. Clara, see if you can get up there, he said. She nodded, and Trenton followed her over, crouching down and lacing his fingers together to give her a step up onto Leon's shoulders. She used the momentum to lightly land her shoes on Leon's shoulders, hooking her elbows over the roof's edge and pulling herself up. "'What do you see?' Sparks called from below. Clara leaned over the drone, seeing a moving camera on it. It stared right at her before moving to the right. She followed the motion to find an envelope wedged in between two of the supports. "'It's got a letter on it,' she called back, and knelt down to pull the letter off. As soon as she was clear, the device rocketed straight up. It rose a few hundred feet into the air and then sped off in the direction it had come from. She turned the envelope over in her hand curiously. It felt thick, easily a few pages folded up inside. "'Did you get it?' Leon asked. "'Yeah,' she replied. "'I'm coming down.' She sat down at the edge, stuffing the letter into her back pocket before turning around and hanging from her hands. Trenton and Leon caught her when she let go, and set her down in the grass. As soon as her feet hit the ground, she grabbed the envelope and held it out to Leon. He took it and waved for them to come inside. "'Come on, let's get in there and find out what this is,' he said. When the group entered the command center, Ethel already had several mugs set up and ready to go, the coffee maker bubbling and hissing as it dispensed the elixir of life. "'Did somebody just get up onto the roof?' the old woman asked, turning around. Clara raised her hand. "'That was me, Ethel,' she said. "'Somebody sent us a telegram.' She chuckled and turned back to the coffee pot. "'Never a dull moment,' she said. Leon sat down in his chair and everyone gathered round as he ripped open the letter. "'Okay, here we go,' he said. "'Says at the top, from R. So I'm guessing Rodriguez?' He skimmed the note and then cleared his throat, reading aloud. Sorry for dropping in, but being watched. I have secured a safe house at the following address. He flipped over the page and saw a hand-drawn map with the location circled. Getting into town will be trickier, he continued. They will need to secure one of our SUVs, and today is the only opening. When I arrive, I will send a scout to the next highway cutoff. Someone will need to go with them and take them out. Whoever goes must remain until the next group comes through. A decoy vehicle must be left and burned out, simulating a crash. It is imperative that our vehicle is undamaged so that it can fall in line tomorrow and join the caravan back into town. I will send multiple vehicles out in the morning with the instruction to rendezvous back in Fabens at sundown to head back to El Paso. Further details and instructions will be left at the safe house. Good luck. The group looked around at each other for a few moments. Well, this day just got a whole lot more difficult, Rufus muttered, running a hand over his hair. Leon folded up the map to the safe house and held it out to Clara. You need to go, now, he instructed. Get to Fort Davis and get them clued in. What about the scout on the bridge? she asked, taking the paper hesitantly. Leon shook his head. Won't be an issue, he replied. Rodriguez told them to expect vehicles coming and going this week. Still, I'd keep one eye on the rear view. Rufus added. Trenton raised a hand. Or I could go with her. No, the fewer people we send out, the less suspicion we're going to arise, Leon replied, shaking his head. Now get moving before they get here this morning. Clara nodded and bolted out the door, off to find a car and get to the interstate before Rodriguez and the cartel crew arrived. As she left, Jeff entered, panting from running from home. What I miss? he asked, as he watched the young woman take off. "'Rufus, can you fill him in?' Leon asked. "'The satellite should be coming over any minute.' He fired up the computer as the older man took Jeff aside and explained the situation. Ethel approached with a tray of mugs, and everyone took one as the computer sprang to life. "'Okay, I guess I'll be that guy,' Trenton finally said as everyone was sipping their hot brew. "'Who are we sending to hijack the SUV?' Leon whirled around in his office chair. "'Rufus is too old, and I can't leave town,' he said slowly. "'So that leaves you, Jeff, and Sparks.' "'It's gonna be me,' the redhead said immediately. Trenton's brow furrowed, and his shoulders straightened a little. 
It's okay. I can do it, he insisted. She shook her head. No, you really can't, she replied. Hey, I've been out here surviving just like you for the past month, he shot back, unable to keep the petulance from his tone. And if this was a you versus zombie situation, you might have a point, she snapped. Tell me, how many men have you killed? He blinked at her, and then swallowed hard, blushing and wringing his hands in front of him. I, um, I mean, I'll take that as none, she cut in, crossing her arms. I, on the other hand, have lost count of the number of lives that I've been forced to take over the last few weeks. I'm already haunted by it, and that's not something that you need to have in your life. The younger man's gaze softened, and he let out a deep breath, stepping back. Thank you, he said quietly. We're up, Leon said as the computer screen flickered on showing a satellite view of Fort Stockton. He scanned the area around it, honing in on the interstate. The horde was as long as ever, stretching almost back into the edges of town. I swear it looks like it's grown, Trenton breathed, despite what we did yesterday. Leon took a deep breath. Well, let's see what we did yesterday, he said. He adjusted the camera, focusing in on the highway to the west. It took him a few moments to locate the mass, since it was only a few thousand strong, but he finally found it. Looks like a blip compared to the main group, he murmured. Jeff took a loud slurp of his coffee and then leaned in. What about the other highway group? he asked. Does it matter? Leon replied with a shrug. It's going to be minimal at best. Matters to me, the skinhead insisted. There's a building a few miles up that had some survivors in it. And you want to check on them? Leon continued, nodding. I'm tracking. He adjusted the camera and moved it up the highway leading to the north. After a few moments, he found the mini horde. Most of the ghouls had moved past the building, although it appeared a small handful had stuck around. Looks like they're pretty much in the clear, he said, assuming they didn't bolt. They were some stubborn old-timers, Jeff replied with a chuckle. They weren't going anywhere. Can you check where I'm going today? Sparks piped up. Leon began to move the camera, and Rufus blinked at her. "'And just where are you going?' he asked, having missed the conversation while getting Jeff up to date. She stared at him defiantly. "'I'm running the mission to get the SUV,' she declared. "'Bull fucking shit you are!' he snapped, clenching his fists. Sparks reached up and took his arm, giving it a reassuring squeeze. "'You know I'm the best person for the job,' she replied gently. And if we're going to pull this off, we all have to do what we have to do. He ran a hand down her cheek, jaw clenched, but finally gave a begrudging nod. Damn it, he muttered. I hate when you're right. He kissed the top of her head. Well, sorry to disappoint you, she said as she looked up at him. But you're going to have to deal with that for a long time, because I plan on being right for quite a while. He smiled and pulled her against him resting his hand on her hip as they turned back to the monitor. Leon isolated the area to the north of the interstate, focusing in on an incredibly small town. This is going to have to be your ambush point, he said, and zoomed in really tight. A few zombies moved about, little black dots in the streets. You're going to have some company as well, he added. Doesn't look like too many, Sparks said, so shouldn't be that difficult. Rufus pulled away from her to knock on the wooden desk with three quick raps. She chuckled, shaking her head. Thanks, she said wryly. Just doing my part, he replied, taking a long sip of his coffee. Chances are that Hammond and his team will pick that spot for the meetup, Leon continued. Or ambush, I guess. Rufus shook his head. Would have been nice if we had time to coordinate with them, he said. Not a fan of all this assuming especially when it comes to a potential firefight. Not going to come to that, Sparks cut in. It's just going to be me and the driver, and he'll never see me coming. Leon moved the camera back to Van Horn, hitting the screenshot button several times before the satellite went out of range. What was that for? Jeff asked. It's not going to take the whole crew to pull zombies off of the interstate today, Leon explained. So I figured we could get a jump on prepping Van Horn. Trenton let out a deep breath. Now there's something I can handle, he said, leaning forward. What's the focus? We need something different for Van Horn, Leon replied. Scout it out, see if anything sparks an idea. Just make sure it can be done in a couple of days, because I don't know how much we're going to be able to slow these things down. 
Rufus rubbed his chin. Rodriguez said he was going to bring some audio equipment so we can set up automated distraction points on the interstate, he pointed out. It's going to be minimal, but it might buy us a few hours. Better than nothing, I suppose, Jeff said. He should be here soon, Leon said, getting to his feet. We should get ready to move. There were begrudging nods all around, and they downed the last of their coffee and bid Ethel goodbye before getting prepped for another day. Chapter 2 The group waited outside of the command center as two trucks and three SUVs pulled up. Angel and Rodriguez hopped out of the first two vehicles, with nearly a dozen other cartel members doing the same. The two leaders walked over to Leon, who had stepped apart from his group. Morning, Rodriguez greeted, clasping his hands in front of him. Leon inclined his head to him, keeping his face a stoic mask. Rodriguez, he said. Have you been able to survey our actions from yesterday? The cartel member asked. Leon nodded. Minimal success, he replied. The zombies you managed to pull away from the horde are still moving away. And the horde? Rodriguez asked. Marching just as fast, if not faster, Leon replied with a sigh. We're projecting them to reach the next highway turn off this evening. Rodriguez tilted his head back and forth. Despite what appears to be a failure... We did learn a lot about the enemy, he said. He snapped his fingers, prompting one of his men to reach into an SUV and pull out a speaker. We worked through the night to create several dozen of these contraptions, solar-powered speakers with a noise generator. One click of a button, and we have a distraction set up. Might not pull many off of the road, but every one that leaves the horde is one less we have to deal with. I agree, Leon said with a nod. So how do you want to do this? I think we should focus our efforts between Van Horn and the next highway, Rodriguez suggested. Leon cocked his head. What about the highway itself? he asked. Could be a good opportunity to divert a few thousand more. Agreed, Rodriguez said with a nod. But what does the satellite say? Wasn't able to get a whole lot before my time ran out, Leon admitted. I was more concerned with how yesterday went and what Van Horn looks like. The cartel member pursed his lips, contemplating for a moment. Javier, he said. Yes, boss, the younger man asked, stepping forward. Take someone from Leon's group to go scout the highway turnoff, Rodriguez said. Right away, Javier said. Trenton froze, his gut twisting. Before he could stop himself, he cried, No! Everyone turned to him with looks of shock and confusion, especially Leon and Rodriguez, glaring dags at him for potentially exposing their plan. I... I need Javier today. Trenton stammered, fighting the urge to wring his hands. We worked really well together against those things yesterday, and if I'm going to get a full scouting report on Van Horn, I could use some competent backup. Rodriguez ran his tongue over his teeth, murder in his stare at the young man. Very well, he finally gritted out. Javier, you're with Trenton today. He paused and glanced over his shoulder. Carlos, you're on highway duty. Sparks, why don't you go with him? Leon piped up, before anyone else could interrupt. You're going to have to blow through Van Horn, since we can't do the roundabout. So if there's any trouble, then you can handle it. The redhead nodded. Works for me, she said, and headed over to Carlos, who stared at her like she was diseased. She extended a hand to him, but he didn't move a muscle to shake it. She shrugged, and they headed off towards one of the vehicles. Juan, Antonio, go with them, Angel suddenly said. The two beefy lunatics didn't speak, simply grunted in response and headed after Sparks and Carlos. Ignore that order, Rodriguez snapped. Angel sneered at him, whirling on the older man. Is there some reason you don't want them to go? he demanded. Huh? It's not necessary that they go, Rodriguez replied coolly, and there's a lot more work to be done. Your bitch buddy here made a good point, Angel snarled, pointing a finger at Leon. They're going to have to go through Van Horn, which could be dangerous. Having these two along for the ride will eliminate any threat they may come across. He spread his arms. And besides, all we're doing today is putting out speakers, and we have more than enough men to do that. So, I'll ask you again. Is there some reason you don't want them to go? Rodriguez stared him down. His hands were tied. Sparks would have a hell of a time with all three men. But if he pressed the issue, Angel would catch on to what they were doing. 
and the whole plan would fall apart. Fine, he said, waving his hand casually. Scout it out and head back. I'll rendezvous with you in four hours. Head two miles west of the highway exit when you're done. Carlos nodded, and the four of them headed to the SUV. Sparks walked ahead of the two beasts and reached the back passenger door. As she opened it, Antonio put his hand against the window and slammed the door closed. She looked up at him, raising an eyebrow and struggling to keep her expression neutral. He stepped over to the front passenger door and opened it, motioning for her to get inside. What kind of gentleman would I be if I didn't allow a lady to ride shotgun? he asked with a sneer. She hesitated for a second, but shoved away her fear and offered him a big smile. Thank you. I appreciate the gesture, she said, and hopped up into the seat. Antonio closed the door for her, and then the rest of them got in before Carlos hit the gas, the SUV speeding off into the distance. Rufus watched it go, every muscle in his body clenched, struggling to keep his worry below the surface. Anything else I should know? Rodriguez asked. Leon nodded. Next satellite pass is in a few hours, and Ethel just made a fresh pot. It would be impolite if I didn't say hello, Rodriguez replied with a smile. The two men headed for the command center, and at the sound of Angel following, they stopped and glanced back at him. We may have a full plate today, Leon drawled, but I guarantee you that I can make room for a quick ass-kicking. Angel jutted out his chin and grunted before spinning around, eyes blazing at his men trying to hold in their laughter. Get mounted up! We have work to do! he bellowed, and everyone scattered to get to work on their assigned tasks for the day. Chapter 3 Clara pulled up to the radio building in Marfa, rushing inside quickly to find it. She hit the button and started speaking rapidly. Andrew, come in, it's Clara, she gushed. Do you copy? After a few moments of silence, she shrieked. Andrew, do you copy? Everything okay? He finally came back. No, it's not, she replied, trying to control her voice. I need to talk to you and our mutual friends. There was a moment of silence. Are you alone? Andrew asked. Yeah, it's just me, she replied. All right, he said. I'll send a car down. The line clicked off and she wandered outside, standing by her vehicle to wait. She looked around at the empty town, marvelling at all the lives that had been snuffed out that would have called this place home. Before her mood could suck her into a depressive episode, she spotted a truck tear around a corner a few blocks down, and sped up to her, screeching to a stop. The passenger side window opened, and a large cowboy leaned over from the driver's seat. Well, come on in, he drawled. Time's a-wasting. Clara hopped in and he punched the gas. The drive up to Fort Davis was a relatively short one, about fifteen minutes given how fast the cowboy handled the truck. They sat in silence for most of the drive, Clara staring out the window at the nothingness that surrounded them. A few miles out from town the driver took a deep breath. Just so you're aware, he said, there may be some people in town who aren't going to treat you too kindly. What? she asked, brow furrowing. Why is that? He tilted his head back and forth. Well, there's a certain contingent of folks who think we should just handle our own business and stay out of the El Paso affair, he explained slowly. They don't think it can lead to anything good, and a few of them have become real vocal when Andrew allowed your military friends to move in. Are they dangerous? Clara asked, folding her hands in her lap. He shook his head immediately. Nah, not really, he replied. At least, not yet. That may change if things go south. There was another tense moment of silence before Clara sighed. So, what do you think about it? She asked, side-glancing him. You want the truth? He drawled. She cocked her head. Only way you could offend me is by lying to me, she assured him. So, what do you think? I think we could do just fine on our own, he admitted. I also think sheltering the military boys puts us all at risk. However, I respect that you put your own ass on the line to make sure we were informed of what's heading our way. So you're okay in my book. She nodded. I appreciate the honesty, she said sincerely. If it'll put your mind at ease, the military will be gone tomorrow. 
My injured friend and his wife will be with you a little longer, though. Ricky and Mary? he asked with a chuckle. I like them. He's a bit of a live wire, ain't he? Clara laughed. Yeah, you should see him when he isn't wounded, she said. She figured a white lie would be a lot easier than explaining that she'd only met Ricky and Mary a week ago. These people were already doing her a huge favor, and she didn't want to do anything to mess that up. The vehicle came around a corner, revealing the town of Fort Davis. The entire community looked like it could fit inside a football stadium, stretching out only a handful of blocks in both directions from the main road. Everything looked like it was in a dust storm, desert terrain everywhere. As they approached the town, there was a large block in the middle of the road made out of cars with metal sheeting welded to the side. The driver honked the horn loudly, and a driver inside one of the cars moved aside to make a gap for the truck to pass through. Clara was in awe of the community inside as they rolled through. People in yards worked in fortifications, kids played catch, even someone rode a bicycle carrying a giant picnic basket full of snacks and bottled water for everyone. Looks like this town is thriving, she breathed. The driver shook his head. Not sure thriving is the right word, but we are holding our own, he admitted. Usually things aren't this busy, but with the current threat and all, people want to take precautions. With any luck, we'll prevent that from happening, Clara replied firmly. He nodded as he drove through town. After a few blocks, he pulled over at a house on the corner, quite a ways away from all of the other activity. Here you go, he said. Your friends are in there. I'm going to go pick up Andrew and bring him by here in a bit. She offered him a smile. I appreciate the lift, she said, and your honesty. He inclined his head towards her, and she got out. She watched the truck speed away and then headed towards the house. Before she could reach the door, it opened, and Whittaker stood there, a hand on her hip. Was wondering when you'd make it up here, the soldier said. You have news? Yep, Clara replied with a nod. We're in business. Whittaker let her inside, revealing Hammond and Landry, lounging around in the living room with their feet propped up, magazines in hand. Look alive, boys. We have company, Whittaker barked. Both men looked up and their eyes lit up at the sight of Clara. They tossed the magazines aside and leapt to their feet. If you're here, then it can mean only one thing. Landry exclaimed. It's time to go get our boy. Clara raised an eyebrow. What? I can't just come visit? She asked. At his concerned expression, she raised a hand. But yes, we have a plan of sorts. Hammond crossed his arms. Of sorts? He asked. Rodriguez has a safe house set up for you, she explained, handing over the map. But getting in is going to be tricky. Whittaker approached Hammond as he unfolded the map. How tricky, she asked. In a nutshell, you're going to have to hijack one of their SUVs, blow up a decoy so they don't get suspicious, and then sneak into a caravan as it leaves Fabens tomorrow night at sundown. Clara rattled off. The three soldiers shared glances, none of them speaking, and she watched the non-verbal conversation before they finally all nodded and smiled. This is going to be a cakewalk, Landry declared, raising a fist. Whittaker rolled her eyes. Wouldn't go that far, she scoffed. What? Are you kidding? He shot back. All we have to do is grab an SUV and drive. If we can't pull that off, we might as well retire from the military. Hammond shook his head. Technically, we're already retired, but I get your point, he said, and then looked to Clara. Where are we supposed to get the SUV from? He asked. North of the interstate here, she replied, jerking a thumb over her shoulder. Rodriguez is going to send a scout with one of our own to check out the diversion area, to make sure it's safe. Just need to ambush them and take the vehicle in one piece. Oh, and leave a burned-out one in its place. Okay, let's get a move on, Hammond barked, clapping his hands together. Whitaker, I saw an SUV with a for sale sign in front of a house a few blocks to the east. Since it's still there, I'm going to assume the owner is dead. So, go purchase it. She nodded. On it, Sarge she said, and headed to grab her gear. Landry, get our weapons prepped, Hammond continued. This sounds like a walk in the park, but the last time we thought that, we ended up in a war against that shitty Silver City gang. We need to be prepared for anything. 
The private darted away, heading into the bedroom to do his job. Whittaker reached the front door with a duffel bag in her hand and threw it open, leaping back when Andrew stood on the other side, hand raised to knock. "'Sorry, ma'am,' he drawled. "'Didn't mean to scare you there.' She chuckled, shaking her head. "'You're good,' she replied. "'Just caught me off guard, is all.' "'Going somewhere?' he asked, raising an eyebrow. "'Yeah, just need to borrow a vehicle,' she explained. "'So I'll be right back.' He offered a smile. "'Well, before you go, I'd appreciate it if you could hear me out real quick,' he said. She paused and glanced back at Hammond. At his nod, she stepped aside and let Andrew in, closing the door behind him. "'Clara, good to see you again,' the cowboy said. "'I trust your trip was uneventful?' she shrugged. "'Just another day of driving through the desert,' she replied. "'Good to hear,' he said, inclining his head towards her. "'So, my driver tells me that you're not going to be with us much longer,' he said, turning to Hammond. "'Is that true?' "'Afraid so,' the sergeant replied. We will be out of your hair tomorrow, and we can't thank you enough for the hospitality you've shown us, especially when you didn't have to take us in at all. Andrew nodded. It's our pleasure, he said. Clara vouched for you, which was good enough in my book. That said, we could use your help today. If we can, Hammond replied. The cowboy waved a hand. There is a turnoff about a mile south of the interstate, a few miles north of here, he explained. I've had my people make some fortifications there to combat any zombies that come our way, but when the time comes, I would feel a whole lot better if you were there. My people can handle a lot, but I get the sense you three can handle a whole hell of a lot more. The sergeant looked at his soldiers, and they both gave sharp nods. Whitaker, can you handle the pickup? he asked. She raised a hand. Won't take me any time at all. Good, get moving, he said, and she offered Andrew a smile before heading out. If you want to get your driver, Landry and I will head up to the barricade and see if we can't devise some sort of worst-case scenario plan. I appreciate that, Andrew replied. He's waiting outside for you. We good to go? the sergeant asked. Landry grinned. Locked and loaded, Sarge. Let's get moving, then, Hammond said, and then paused, reaching out and putting a hand on Clara's shoulder. Thank you for this. She smiled back at him. You just make sure you bring Mathis home. I can promise you that the sergeant replied, and then followed Landry outside. So, what are your plans? Andrew asked. You are more than welcome to stay in town with us until the immediate threat passes. Clara shook her head. I need to get back to Fabens, she said. Don't want to raise suspicion. Come on, I'll give you a lift myself, he replied, waving for her to follow him. They headed outside and hopped into a pickup truck on the side of the road, a few houses down. Once they were speeding down the highway, Andrew took a deep breath. So, level with me, he said. How bad is it out there? She sighed. It's bad, she admitted. Despite our best efforts, we only slowed them down by a couple of hours. Only managed to peel off a few thousand of them as well. I'm beginning to have real concerns about whether or not we're going to survive this. I'm trying to keep my people optimistic, he said, shaking his head that we'll be able to hold off whatever comes our way. But if I'm hearing you right, I should be concerned. She chewed her bottom lip for a moment. The first exit we encountered this horde at had a small town about a mile away from it, she said quietly. Within hours, the entire town was overrun. If they start coming your way, you do whatever you have to in order to stop them. He swallowed hard, finally nodding, and the two fell silent for the rest of the drive back to Marfa. Chapter 4 Carlos drove the SUV off of the interstate, making the turn to the north. How much time do we have? Antonio asked from the back seat. Sparks checked her watch. Three hours until we meet up with them, she replied. Good, Antonio said with a nod. Plenty of time to check this place out. She stared out the window, trying to ignore the knot in her stomach. She was unsure of what awaited them up ahead. She hoped that whoever in the military group that was waiting for them had the good sense to wait for the best moment to launch the ambush. The drive up to the small town area didn't take very long, no more than a few minutes. Everyone kept their eyes peeled for zombies, but outside of the occasional one stuck in roadside barbed wire, it was a whole lot of nothing. 
The town area was minimal, only about four short blocks of buildings with a single row of storefronts. There were a few blocks of houses on the other side of things. If the population was over a hundred, Sparks would have been shocked. Park over there, Antonio instructed, pointing. Carlos pulled over and the four of them got out of the car. Sparks wandered around to the front of the vehicle, looking down the street at a dozen zombies shambling their way in front of a store near the edge of town. We have some company, she said, and then glanced back at the sound of metallic clanging from behind her. Juan and Antonio stood there, each brandishing two machetes, one in each hand. They stared straight ahead, surveying the threat that was about forty yards away and closing. She raised an eyebrow, unable to keep from noticing that the top of her head only reached their shoulders. Don't worry, we shall give them a proper welcome, Juan declared. Spark shrugged. If you want them, have at it, she said, motioning to the mini horde. I'll start scoping out the rest of town. Antonio turned to Carlos, eyes blazing with warning. If you're not with her when we get back, he said, voice cold, we'll make you wish you were. He swallowed hard beneath the threat, and then turned to Sparks. Lead the way, he said. She wandered around the back of the SUV with her companion in tow. There was an alley about ten yards up that cut across to the next street. As they approached, she peeked back to see two hulking lunatics hack and slashing at the zombies. One right after the other fell violently, catching machetes to the head before being kicked to the ground. The duo worked in concert with each other, taking turns delivering the killing blow to the ghouls. Sparks couldn't help but be impressed by what she saw, followed by concern knowing that she was going to have to face off against them soon enough. First things first, though, she led Carlos down the alley, about a quarter of the way down when a couple of ghouls appeared at the far end, and started working their way towards them. Sparks drew her knife, and then glanced at her companion, who was weaponless. Do you not have a knife? she asked. I do, he said slowly, avoiding her gaze, but I'm not very good with it. She shook her head. Well, you'd better get good with it, she motioned towards the creeping ghouls, and then took a step forward. Carlos was close behind her, and she attacked the first one by shoving it in the chest. It stumbled back into one of its friends, and Sparks took the opportunity to plant her foot and kick off, slamming her blade down into the zombie's skull. As that one fell silent, she pressed hard, pinning the other against the wall. It thrashed violently, and she struggled to hold it in place. Stab it already! she cried. Carlos finally rushed up, flailing wildly with his knife. His first attempt to take out the ghoul ended with the blade piercing its cheek which did nothing to it. He tried again, this time missing entirely and cutting the bridge of its nose. You miss one more time and we're switching places, Sparks growled. The threat motivated him, and he took a brief moment to aim before finally jamming the knife into the ghoul's ear. It convulsed for a moment before falling limp. Sparks let go, dropping both corpses to the ground, ripping her knife from the first one's head. He looked at her sheepishly, and she pursed her lips before shaking her head. Come on, she said. Let's check out the next street. She led him down the alley and peeked around the corner to look for trouble around the end. Both directions were empty, not a single moving creature. Looks like a whole lot of nothing, she murmured. As she turned back, Carlos peeked out and then headed over to a corpse laying face down on the ground about thirty yards away. What are you doing? she hissed. Let's get back to the others. There's a body over here, he said. Sparks sighed. It's a zombie apocalypse, she said. There are bodies everywhere. He didn't listen, continuing to approach the corpse. He stared down at it, and then looked back at her, still standing at the corner. You gotta see this, he said. She threw her hands up. I've seen dead zombies before, she insisted. Just come here, he urged sounding irritated. She sighed again, and then sauntered over and looked at the head wound he was pointing at that was still oozing blood. Someone is here, he declared. Sparks's heart rate tripled, but she knew she needed to downplay this. Look around, she spread her arms, keeping her voice level. Nobody has been here for weeks. I'm telling you, he said firmly, someone is here. 
Even if there is, she shot back, they aren't going to be for very long once we bring thousands of those things through here. He whirled on her, looking like he was about to forcefully state his case, when a gunshot rang out. Both of them jumped, whirling towards the main road. It's probably just those two maniacs having some fun, Sparks said. Carlos narrowed his eyes, and she could almost feel the suspicion rolling off of him. Before he could say anything, there was a torrent of gunfire, and then he took off like a shot. Sparks moved to follow him, but she tripped over the fallen ghoul, throwing out her hands to keep herself from face-planting into the pavement. When she straightened up, he was almost all the way down the alley. Shit, she muttered, and raced towards him, pumping her legs hard. The gunfire continued unabated, multiple shots being fired. When she reached the end of the alley, she popped around the corner just in time to see Carlos emerging from the rear of the SUV, holding an assault rifle. She quickly scanned the battlefield to get a lay of the land. To her left were the two cartel psychopaths that had taken up position behind two large wooden posts outside a store. To her right was Whittaker, who was firing from an entrenched position inside a store. Carlos spotted Whittaker and moved to the same side of the street as Juan and Antonio, putting himself in a flanking position to get an angled shot at the soldier. Sparks knew she didn't have a choice. She leapt into action, rushing towards him. He was twenty yards away and kneeling down to get a proper shot. She tried to close the gap quickly. He could fire at any moment. When she was ten yards away, she saw his shoulders tighten and realized that he had Whittaker in his sights. She whipped her knife at him end over end as she continued to run. It wasn't a precise throw, nor was it meant to be. Even under the best circumstances, Sparks would have had trouble delivering a kill shot with a knife from ten yards. But as the knife broadsided him, it did its job, which was to stun him for a brief moment. Carlos glanced back just in time to see Sparks closing in on him. He tried to adjust his aim, but she was too quick, leaping and delivering a knee strike to the face. What the fuck, bitch? he cried as he fell to the ground, nose shattered. He glared up at her, realization dawning on his face, and he spat blood onto the concrete before drawing his knife and getting to his feet, swiping at her. Sparks leapt back, avoiding the blade. As he came in for a straight jab, she darted out of the way and grabbed his wrist, using the momentum to fling him forward. As he stumbled forward a few steps, she grabbed her knife. As soon as he turned around, she drove it into his shoulder, causing him to scream and flail. He managed to cut her cheek, and she leapt back, wiping at it as he staggered, seemingly unable to move his wounded arm. You bitch! he spat, and then screamed, tearing towards her in a rage-filled attack. Sparks didn't move, waiting for her moment to deliver a forceful straight kick to his chest while avoiding the knife. He smacked back onto the ground with a grunt. She hopped on top of him, her knees on his arms, and grabbed his ears, smacking his skull into the pavement. The first crack stunned him, causing him to drop the knife. The second crack sent a splatter of blood across the ground. The third, fourth, and fifth cracks completely caved in the back of his head, and he fell limp. Sparks gave him one more just for good measure, and then got up. The gunfire in the distance continued as she ran over to grab the assault rifle. She gave it a quick check to make sure it was ready to go before creeping up the sidewalk towards Juan and Antonio's position. When she got within twenty yards of them, she made eye contact with Whittaker, and they shared a nod. The gunfire coming from the duo's position was intense and sustained. She didn't see them leave the vehicle with rifles, so she assumed they were using handguns. Knowing how crazy they were, she had no idea how many magazines they were carrying. As she reached the edge of the building, she stood behind a recessed pillar a few yards off from the street. It was difficult to see them, although she could see their shadows moving. Sparks took a deep breath before coming around the corner, darting into position so she had them in her sights. Put it down, now, she barked. Both men paused and then glanced back at her. They looked at each other and then back at her. So, the shooter is with you, Antonio asked. She nodded sharply. Yep, afraid so. What of Carlos? He shot back. Had to kill him, she replied with a sigh. 
wasn't my first choice, but what we're doing needs to be done. I'm not letting anybody stand in my way. Juan cocked his head. And what exactly are you doing? He asked. We're taking out Tiago Rivas, Spark said. The men exchanged another glance and then nodded. So, you're working with Rodriguez? Antonio asked. The redhead's blood ran cold. What makes you say that? She demanded. We had a suspicion he had a hand in the assassination attempt, Juan explained. But no way to prove it, Antonio added. Juan grinned. Until now, that is. Antonio ducked to the ground, and Juan turned and quickly fired towards Sparks. She managed to roll around the pillar, firing as she did, but missing. Antonio leapt forward, catching her in the gun and ramming her into the glass behind them. Their combined weight sent them crashing through it, landing hard on the floor. He ended up on top, Sparks dazed from the hard landing. He punched down, catching her in the face, but missed the second as she rolled out of the way. He cried out in pain as his fist connected with the floor. Sparks grabbed a shard of glass from the broken window and jammed it into the side of his leg, leaving it wedged in there. He screamed and reached for it, giving her a chance to snatch up another shard and bury it in his side. Antonio rolled off of her, and she shoved him onto his back. As she pulled herself from the ground, she spotted Juan approaching from the outside, gun raised. Her heart seemed to stop as she stared down that barrel and her breath caught in her throat as he smirked at her. A barrage of bullets cracked, and Juan pitched forward, falling to the ground, and revealing Whitaker behind him from across the street. Sparks nodded at her, and then whipped around at the sound of shuffling. Antonio staggered to his feet, holding the shard from his leg, and extended it, blood running down his hand. You're going to pay for this, he hissed. She shrugged. Unlikely. He screamed and rushed her, bringing the glass down in a wide, sloppy arc. Sparks ducked and darted to the side, punching him in the side of the head as she came around. Before he could even register it, she kicked out the side of his knee, dropping him to the ground. She took a short step back and then delivered a forceful straight kick into his face, sending him crashing down into the broken glass. He twitched and moaned, and she raised her hands, preparing to strike again as he struggled to sit up. Damn girl, you okay? Whitaker asked as she stepped through the broken window, gun aimed at the cartel member. Sparks nodded, shoulders relaxing. Yeah, I've had worse, she said. Antonio snarled. You're gonna have worse when I'm done with- Whitaker popped a bullet into his knee to cut him off, and he shrieked, curling around his legs. We're talking here, wait your turn, the soldier snapped, and turned to Sparks. Anything you want to ask him? The redhead stared him down. Who else knows about Rodriguez? She asked. Antonio stared her down, saying nothing. Whitaker cocked her head. You can talk now. Fuck you! He spat, breathing ragged. She pulled the trigger again, sending a round into his ankle, and sending him into another pain-filled rage fit. Just so you know, I have three more mags and a couple of hours before I have to be anywhere, she said calmly. Use that information however you like. Again, Sparks continued. Who else knows about Rodriguez? Antonio hissed and took in a deep, gasping breath. No one knows for sure, he bit out. Just a lot of suspicion, like us. What about Tiago and Angel? she pressed. You'll never convince them otherwise that Rodriguez isn't involved he replied, managing to smirk through the pain. Sparks sighed. Figured as much, she said. Which is why we're going to deal with them. Good luck with that, he said with a sneer. That didn't work out so well for your friend, now did it? Whitaker pumped another few rounds into his legs, and he shrieked and writhed, flopping back onto the floor. Free advice, the soldier snapped. Don't mention my friend ever again. She looked over at Sparks. You got anything else for him? The redhead shook her head. Nah, I'm good, she replied. Whittaker aimed and fired one more shot, hitting Antonio in the face and dropping him permanently. Sparks looked down at her arms, finding numerous shallow cuts from rolling around on the glass. She headed for a rack of t-shirts and pulled one down, tearing it into strips to use as a bandage. 
That my SUV up the road? The soldier asked. Yeah, keys should be in it, Sparks replied. Though if you want to do me a favor, can you pump a few rounds into the corpse up there? My story is going to be easier to sell if he's bullet-ridden. Whitaker nodded. Consider it done, she said. Although, before I go, I do have a question. Sure, Sparks replied as she wound the soft cotton fabric around her arms. Why didn't you just open fire on these assholes? The soldier asked. Not like you to hesitate. The redhead sighed. I thought we could turn them to our side, she admitted. At the sight of Whitaker's raised eyebrows, she held up her palms. Yeah, I know. He was stupid, she said. But after talking with Rodriguez yesterday, he made it sound like these guys weren't loyal to Tiago. And while I have the utmost confidence in you guys, it remains to be seen if Rodriguez can manufacture another shot at Tiago for you. So I was just trying to prepare on the off chance that didn't happen. Whitaker nodded slowly. I can understand that, but still, she said. Trust me, I know, Sparks replied with another deep sigh. Not going to be making that mistake again. The soldier cocked her head. So, what else do you need from me? She asked. Nothing I can think of. Outside of dragging that other son of a bitch in here, Sparks said. Then just going to set fire to the building and the SUV you came in before taking it easy and waiting for pickup. They headed outside, stepping through the broken window to get the other corpse. You know, after we survive this, Whitaker said, you and I need to grab Clara and Ethel and have a full-on girls' night. Sparks's brow furrowed in confusion. You mean like drinking mimosas and doing each other's nails type of girls' night? She asked dryly. Oh, fuck no, Whitaker huffed as she grabbed Juan's legs. I mean a couple bottles of scotch while we play poker and talk shit about the guys. Sparks laughed as she grabbed his arms and they carried him into the store. That makes a lot more sense, she said. They shared a laugh as they tossed the body down with Antonio's. The redhead pulled out a lighter, grabbing another t-shirt from the rack. She casually lit it up and tossed it back onto the two dead men. They wandered back outside as the fire started to spread, and the women shared a fist bump. All right, girl, Whitaker said. I'll see you in a few days. Sparks nodded and smirked. I'll make sure to procure us a few bottles of scotch. The soldier winked at her and jogged off, popping a few rounds into Carlos before speeding off in the SUV. Sparks turned to watch the store go up in flames, sending huge plumes of smoke into the air. She scanned the rest of the street and spotted a small coffee shop a block down. She checked her watch. Well, I've got time, she muttered to herself. Guess I should get comfy. Chapter 5 Landry and Hammond helped fortify a makeshift barricade near the gas station on the highway, less than a mile south of the interstate that they could faintly see from their location. The barricade wasn't the best, just several cars pushed together with the tire shot out and reinforced with various debris. There were three other cowboys roaming around, unloading more debris from their trucks to put in front. The soldiers stepped around to survey their work. Well, the good news is, this thing should hold off ten, maybe twelve of those things, long enough for us to kill them, Landry drawled. Hammond let out a humorless laugh. And the bad news? he asked. The odds of them coming in packs of twelve are about the same as a porn star riding over the horizon excited to see me, Landry replied dryly. An SUV appeared on the horizon headed their way. Both soldiers paused confused, staring as it approached. Whitaker rolled down the window and leaned her elbow on it to look at them. Well, we dodged that bullet, Hammond drawled, because there's zero chance that she's excited to see you. The men both burst into laughter, and she furrowed her brow. I miss something? she asked. The sergeant shook his head. Nothing you'd be thrilled about hearing. Rather than press my luck, I'm going to move on, Whitaker said. Landry wiped fake tears from his eyes. Probably for the best. This the vehicle? Hammond asked. Yep, primed and ready to go, Whitaker replied, smacking the outside of the door. Pretty sure there are a few weapons in the back, too. Landry raised a fist. I will never turn down free weapons, he said. Any trouble? Hammond asked. Bit of a firefight, Whitaker explained, shaking her head. 
Sparks got a little banged up, but she strikes me as the kind of girl that celebrates new scars. Landry grinned, starting to think she might be one of us. You had doubts? Hammond asked, raising an eyebrow. The private chuckled. Well, no, but this just solidifies it, he said. Whittaker sighed as she looked over the barricade. That's looking like a shit show, she said. How about instead of criticizing, you start coming up with some solutions? Landry joked, putting his hands on his hips. Whittaker shook her head at him and pulled the SUV off of the road before getting out. She strolled over to her fellow soldiers, staring up the two-lane road and cocking her head in thought. Why don't you boys go check out the gas station, she suggested. See if you can't find some containers for gas. I'll take it from here. The men shrugged at each other, chuckling as they headed off for the gas station. Whittaker glanced over at one of the workers, letting out a whistle. Hey, cowboy, she called. He wandered over and tipped his ten-gallon hat at her. Yes, ma'am. Oh, polite. I like that, she replied with a smile. He straightened his shoulders. My mama raised me right, he declared. I can see that, she replied with a nod. So tell me, Mr. Cowboy, do you have any bobbed wire handy? He laughed. Ma'am, this is rural Texas, he drawled. Asking a working cowboy if they have barbed wire handy is like asking a barbecue restaurant if they have brisket. That answer is always going to be yes. She smiled as he let out a long whistle, gaining the attention of one of the other workers. He pointed to the truck behind the line and waved, signaling to have it brought over. A few moments later, the truck backed up to them. Whittaker and the cowboy moved over to the bed and rummaged around, pushing various building materials out of the way, finally coming across a large spindle of barbed wire. The cowboy grabbed it and dragged it to the tailgate. Here you go, ma'am, he said with a flourish. Top of the line stuff. Whittaker nodded. How strong is it? she asked. If you're looking for a math answer, I'm not going to be of much use there, he admitted. But it's strong enough to make a heifer think twice about pushing through it. Good enough for me, she replied with a nod, and then continued, looking through the back of the truck. The cowboy cocked his head. Something else you need, ma'am? he asked. Metal posts? Something to drive them into the ground with? Whittaker said slowly. And some wire cutters? He nodded and tossed some of the materials aside. After a few moments, he pulled out the things she needed, as well as a set of thick work gloves. If you're going to be working with the barbed wire, he said, holding them out, I'd recommend these too. Very kind of you, she said, slipping them on. Now, if you'd like to fill me in on what you're planning to use this stuff for, he continued, hooking a thumb into his belt, I can pull the boys off of the barricade and give you a hand. At her sharp look, he raised a palm. Don't get me wrong, ma'am, he said quickly. I have no doubt you are fully capable of everything you intend on doing. However, since we are on the clock, so to speak, I figured you might welcome some help to speed things along. Whittaker smirked at him. You're all right there, cowboy, she said. Your mama did raise you right. Get your buddies, because we have some work to do. The cowboy nodded and whistled, and two workers hurried over, and at his motion to Whittaker, looked to her. Okay, gents, she said. This is what I need. I need posts on either side of the road so we can run the wire across. We're going to double up, so make sure they are secure. How many we got? We got eight, ma'am, the cowboy replied. She nodded. That works. Give me one line on either side of the gas station, she instructed. I want half of the barbed wire on the barricade side of the station, a quarter on the interstate side, and the rest blocking off the gas station. There's going to be a hell of a lot of pressure on this line, so you put it up how you see fit. That's your area of expertise, not mine. The other two cowboys nodded and grabbed the gear, rushing off to work on the task. The one she'd been talking with stood there as he chewed over the instructions. So, you're going to try to herd them like cattle, huh? he asked. Whittaker nodded. Herd them up and give us a last-ditch contingency plan, she replied. I don't follow, he said, brow furrowing. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to hold them off with those two wire traps, she explained. Thin them out enough so we can fall back to the barricade you've built and finish them off. However, if there's a lot more than we anticipate or the barbed wire doesn't hold, we can use the gas station to give us a chance. He glanced over at the station as Hammond and Landry wandered over with a bunch of empty containers. His eyes widened when he realized what she meant. Not sure Andrew is going to be too happy with that, he said. 
Whittaker sighed. To be fair, big fella, none of us are going to be happy if it comes to that, she agreed. That'll mean we're getting our asses handed to us. That's why it's a last resort. I trust y'all will do the right thing, the cowboy finally said. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to go help them out so they don't screw it up. She nodded. I'll be over in a minute to help, she said. The cowboy walked off to help the others as the soldiers approached. Looks like you got them working pretty good, Hammond said. Whittaker looked over the containers they brought, mostly glass beer bottles. Don't tell me you dumped those out, she asked. Nah, they had a recycling area, if you can believe that, Landry explained. There's a couple more six-packs worth in there if we need them. We will, she said. Hammond glanced over at the working cowboys. You're setting up a playpen, aren't you? he asked, crossing his arms. Yep, she replied. These things aren't that bright, so they'll march right into it. Hammond grinned. All right, let's get us some Molotovs made, he said, motioning to Landry. The two of them headed over to the gas station to start filling bottles, and Whittaker looked up towards the interstate. She took a deep breath, knowing that within hours the view would be a lot more horrific. Chapter 6 Rodriguez and a cartel member drove up the road from the interstate, heading towards the area where Sparks' team had been sent. It had been an hour since they were supposed to check in, and there had been no contact. Miguel, get your gun ready, Rodriguez said. His partner raised an eyebrow. Expecting trouble, boss? he asked. They should have been back by now, he replied. I just don't want to take any chances. Miguel reached into the back seat, grabbing an assault rifle and checking it to make sure it was ready. Rodriguez forced a worried look on his face and floored it. When they grew closer to town, they spotted a plume of smoke in the distance. Boss, look, Miguel gasped. Rodriguez furrowed his brow. What the hell is going on? he breathed. His partner chambered around and rolled down his window. Whatever it is, I'm going to handle it, he declared. They scanned the road when they reached the shopping area, and spotted Carlos lying dead next to a flaming SUV. "'Man down!' Miguel cried, and without waiting for instructions, bolted from the SUV and swept the area for hostiles. He reached Carlos, and at the sight of his chest full of bullet holes, let out a scream. "'Come on out, motherfuckers!' he bellowed. "'You have me to deal with now!' Rodriguez parked and got out, handgun at the ready. "'Who is it?' he asked sternly. "'Looks like Carlos,' Miguel replied. "'At least I think it is. Fucked his face all up.' They turned towards the burning store a few blocks down, which was completely engulfed in flames. The two of them moved slowly towards it, keeping their guard up and scanning the area for movement. As they got a little closer, they could make out bodies of zombies that littered the street. A few moments later, the door to a coffee shop a little ways down opened. "'Get in here!' Sparks hissed from the floor, her head sticking through the door. The men were confused as they searched for the owner of the voice, finally finding her. Now! she snapped. They raced over to the coffee shop and ducked inside. She slammed the door and led them quickly behind some tables that she'd turned over on their side. What's going on? Rodriguez asked. Where are Juan and Antonio? Miguel demanded. Sparks shook her head, motioning towards the burning building with a defeated expression. Miguel clenched his jaw, eyes blazing. "'What happened?' Rodriguez asked, voice calm and forceful as he put a hand on his partner's shoulder to mellow him out. "'We pulled into town and didn't see a whole lot going on,' Sparks began, swallowing hard. "'Juan and Antonio went to clear out that small horde down the street while Carlos and I checked the next block up. We heard shots, a lot of them, and came running back. Carlos was ahead of me and got cut down.' She took a deep breath. The other two were pinned down, but when I tried to help I got ambushed. I went through a glass window, and from there it's a bit of a blur. Just bullets and beatdowns. By the time the fog lifted, the fighting was over, the store over there was on fire, and I just took shelter. Rodriguez and Miguel shared a look, rage in their eyes. How many were there? Rodriguez bit out, forcing extra malice into his voice. Spark shook her head. Four, maybe five? she rasped. I'm not entirely sure. Just give me the word, boss, and I'll hunt these bastards down, Miguel growled. Rodriguez let out a deep breath. No. 
We don't have time. Don't have time, his subordinate roared. The horde waits on no one, Rodriguez shot back firmly. Besides, what better revenge is there than to surround our enemies with something they can't overcome? Let them sit and suffer as their life slowly drains. Miguel was still angry, but gave a begrudging nod. The trio worked their way to the door, and Sparks pressed herself against the frame. I'll cover the right, if you can get the left, she said, and Miguel nodded, hopping from foot to foot as if excited to get into the action. Don't forget the rear, Rodriguez added. They could be on the roof. Both the others nodded, and he put his hand on the doorknob. After a silent countdown, he threw open the door. The trio sprinted outside, racing towards the SUV. Sparks and Miguel stayed vigilant, sweeping the area to the sides and scanning the rooftops for enemies. Rodriguez leapt into the SUV, firing it up, and as soon as the others were inside, Miguel raised his hand, whirling it in the air. We're in! Go! he barked. Rodriguez threw the SUV in reverse and hit the gas, sending the vehicle speeding back. When it reached a couple hundred yards away from the buildings, he cut the wheel hard, causing it to spin a hundred and eighty degrees. He quickly put it in drive, speeding back towards the interstate. When they reached it, they looked east, seeing the front edge of the horde on the horizon. What is that, a mile? Sparks said, shaking her head. Miguel nodded. Maybe a little more, he agreed. Definitely not much more. Come, we have much to do, Rodriguez declared, and started driving again, pulling onto the road and heading up a mile to the meet-up spot. When they arrived, there were two vehicles on the side of the road. Angel stood outside with four other cartel members, and he eyed them warily when his men emerged with only a bloodied Sparks. Where are the others? he demanded. Dead, Miguel replied, shaking his head. Angel pushed away from the truck, stalking up to Sparks with fire in his eyes. She didn't react, though internally prepared herself for a fight, just in case. What the fuck did you do, bitch? he snarled. Miguel growled. They were ambushed. Angel glared at him, and the man visibly withered. If I want you to speak, I'll rip your head off and use it as a puppet, he snapped. Miguel took a step back, palms up. Angel turned back to Sparks, leaning in so they were almost nose to nose. What the fuck did you do? he demanded. Like he said, we were ambushed, she replied, motioning to Miguel. I tried to help the others, but... She held up her arms, showing off all of her cuts. As you can see, it didn't work out too well. Angel lashed out, grabbing her injured wrist, and opened his mouth to speak. Before he could get out a single sound, she jerked her arm forward and used his off-balance momentum to snatch the back of his collar and slam his face down onto the hood of the SUV. As he lay there in shock, she leaned down, lips close to her ear. You listen here, motherfucker. You're not pulling this macho bullshit on me, she said, voice low and menacing. This is your one warning. You ever touch me like that again, and I swear to all that is holy, will be the last thing you ever do. You got me? He groaned a bit as she smooshed his face harder into the hood. Two of the other cartel members took a step towards them, but Rodriguez put a hand to stop them. After a moment, Angel finally nodded, cheek sticking to the hot fiberglass. Good. Spark snapped, and then jerked him off of the hood, throwing him down onto his ass. One of the cartel members moved to help him up, but he shoved his hands away. Get off me, he huffed, and got to his feet. Face red and eyes on fire, he whirled around to his lackeys. Get in your vehicles! We're going to go find these ambushers, he yelled. Assuming they exist, he threw back at Sparks. You're not going anywhere, Rodriguez said calmly. Angel pointed a finger at him. You're not going to stop me. Rodriguez stepped forward, and though his body looked relaxed, his voice was forceful. You're not going, he said. The horde is almost here, and I'm not going to have a hothead risk all of our lives. Angel jutted out his chin, staring up at him for a moment, before finally letting out a huff. Fine. If you want to do this all on your own, have at it, he bit out. I've done my job putting those speakers out. He snapped his fingers, and one of the cartel members handed him a notebook. He shoved it into Rodriguez's chest and then whirled on his heel. That's where they are, he barked over his shoulder. If you want anything else, then do it your damn self. 
he jumped into the passenger seat of the truck, and when his lackeys didn't move, he reached out to the window and banged on the outside of the door. Let's go, he bellowed. I want to be back in El Paso by dinner. The men snapped, rushing into their vehicles and taking off, tires squealing. Once they were gone, Rodriguez turned to his two companions. Looks like it's just us, he replied. Would have been nice to have the truck, Miguel muttered. We'll make do, Rodriguez said. Sparks motioned to the SUV. Does that back window open? she asked. Miguel shook his head. Not on its own, he replied, and then raised his gun. But I have the right tool for the job. He walked over and began smashing out the back window, leaving Rodriguez and Sparks out of earshot. Did they get the vehicle? Rodriguez asked quietly. She nodded. Yeah, and it wasn't damaged, she said. Good, he replied. Something else you should know, she murmured, watching Miguel closely. Before we took them out, Antonio said they suspected you were behind the attack on Tiago, and they weren't the only ones. Rodriguez nodded. That's not surprising. Still, I think you should take extra precautions, she said. I'm afraid we're well past the point of precautions, he replied with a sigh. Things are in motion that can't be stopped. All we can do at this point is hope. Miguel finished clearing the back window and sauntered back over to them. I got most of the glass on the outside, but there's still some in the back, he said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. I can take that fire position if you like. Sparks held up her bloody arms. A couple more cuts aren't going to make much of a difference, she replied. No sense in you getting cut up as well. You take the sunroof. Miguel nodded. We should move, Rodriguez said. That horde will not wait. The trio got into their vehicle and into firing positions as he began driving towards the zombie mass, the horde of rotting flesh that continued its death march unabated. Chapter 7 Rodriguez had the SUV parked a few hundred yards from the exit as Sparks sat in the back with her gun propped up on the edge of the broken window. Miguel stood up through the sunroof. The trio sat in collective silence, letting the sounds of moaning and shuffling feet fill the air. The massive swarm of ghouls that still stretched for miles was within a hundred yards of them. The stench wafting from it was like nothing any of them had ever experienced before. Hey, Rodriguez, Sparks called back. You got any music? I think I've had my fill of the Texas Undead Choir. Miguel leaned down. I second that, boss, he said. Rodriguez reached down and flipped on the radio, which was far too loud and filled the air with static. He winced and turned it down, then flipped it over to the CD player. Sorry about that, he called back as he fiddled with it. Better than what we were listening to, Sparks admitted. After a few moments, the speakers blasted the upbeat sound of guitar and heavy trumpet. A singer jumped in, in Spanish, and the tempo picked up. Sparks bobbed her head along with the beat. Mariachi band? she asked. Banda, Rodriguez replied. Mariachi is just guitar. Banda includes the brass. She nodded. Learn something new every day. Do you like it? he asked. She shrugged. Wouldn't be my first pick off of the CD rack, but it wouldn't be my last either, she admitted. He smiled. I can understand that, he said, especially if you didn't grow up with it. My parents raised me with a steady dose of classic rock and golden oldies, Sparks said, so I have an appreciation for a wide variety of music. The song hit a quiet spot, allowing for the moans to creep back into her ears again. And at the moment I am very appreciative of banda music, she muttered. The next song kicked up, another higher tempo track drowning out the zombies again. If only something could drown out the stench, Miguel quipped. Rodriguez glanced back to see the horde was at the thirty-yard mark. Here we go, he declared, and put the SUV into drive, inching forward. He kept pace with the sea of ghouls, making sure they wouldn't gain on them or be left behind. As they got to the exit, both Miguel and Sparks started popping off shots. One by one they dropped corpses, but more importantly, they pulled a significant number of them in their direction. As they crept up the exit, hundreds followed them in pursuit of a meal they'd never get. They kept moving and firing, trying to pull as many as they possibly could in their direction. As they reached the top of the exit ramp, 
Rodriguez paused to allow them to catch up a bit, and allow for the gunners to fire rapidly in one last attempt to pull them off of the interstate. While this was happening, Sparks looked to the other side of the exit, seeing a significant number of zombies going in that direction as well. She shook her head, knowing that the group in that direction was going to be in for a fight. She turned her attention back to their group, firing several more rounds back towards the mass on the interstate. She managed to start another small trickle of ghouls in their direction, but it was quickly cut off by the force of the horde. "'I think that's all we're going to get,' Sparks called. In a last-ditch effort, he cranked the radio up as high as it would go and laid on the horn. As he did this, he started inching forward, leading the ghouls up the highway towards the town. After about a quarter mile, he toned things down. "'Miguel, what do you see?' he asked. The roof gunner leaned down. "'Looks like we got a couple thousand, he replied. "'Maybe three if we're lucky.' "'What about the other side of the highway?' Sparks asked. "'A thousand, maybe, a little more.' Miguel replied. Rodriguez nodded. Good to know that us doing this is at least making somewhat of a difference, he said. Would hate it if it was for nothing. Boss, I'm going to stay up here until we get through town, Miguel said. If we come across any of those fuckers, I want to be ready. Rodriguez nodded again. Brace yourself, then, he called, because we're picking up the pace. As he hit the gas, all Sparks could do was look out the back window. Her thoughts were with Whittaker, Hammond, and Landry, as well as the others up in Fort Davis. The only thing that kept her from panicking was knowing that if anybody could hold off the group, it was those three. She took a deep breath. Good luck, guys. Chapter 8 Hammond, Landry, and Whittaker stood in the middle of the road on the interstate side of the barricade. The gunshots they'd heard earlier had long since fallen quiet. Replacing them was a steady stream of moans that grew louder and louder, footsteps getting closer and closer. There was a hill crest about three hundred yards away, and the first zombie's head appeared atop it. "'It begins,' Whittaker muttered. "'Let's just hope it's only a handful of those things,' Landry drawled, stretching his arms above his head. She raised an eyebrow. "'What, you aren't confident in our abilities?' she asked. He glanced over his shoulder to the barbed wire barricade and the six cowboys standing in it, holding a wide variety of farm instruments and other tools. We have half a dozen farm boys with axes and hammers, he said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. If we were trying to build a barn or till a field, then I would be ecstatic about our current situation. But seeing as how we're about to face off against God only knows how many zombies, I'm not liking our chances. We've been in worse spots. Hammond piped up. Remember the ribose operation? Landry shuddered. God damn it, Sarge. I thought I had successfully drank enough to kill the brain cells that remembered that, he whined. Why did you have to bring that up? Just wanted to remind you that it could always be worse, the sergeant replied. The trio turned back towards the horde, now a good hundred yards over the crest of the hill, and still coming. You were saying, Landry said, waving a hand at the oncoming ghouls, because that's looking like a whole lot of motherfuck right there. Whittaker took a deep breath. Guess we should go give these guys a pep talk before the shitstorm hits, she said. Or before they shit themselves, Landry muttered. Let's move, Hammond said, turning around. The three of them headed back to the wire barricade, ducking under it to get inside the makeshift box. The two privates headed over to retrieve their melee weapons before flanking Hammond, who straightened his shoulders. All right, everybody, listen up, he declared. Those things are here, and there are more than we thought. Now, before anybody panics, you need to know we can handle this. Sir, one of the cowboys piped up, raising his hand. With all due respect, does it look like any of us panic about anything other than our wives getting a hold of our phones when we're not around? There was a light smattering of laughter, and Hammond smirked. Fair enough, he said. Even with a level head, though, it's going to be an uphill battle to hold these things off. As soon as they start getting to the line, you need to start going at them. Headshots, nothing but headshots. One clean strike will end them in a hurry. You do as much damage as you can before this line breaks. When it does, I want all six of you behind that next line set up and do it again. The three of us will handle the gas station. He glanced over his shoulder at the horde, which was still coming over the hill. 
He tilted his head back and forth, doing some quick math in his head, counting over a thousand and still going. We use him mostly gas, he continued, so that fire is going to get intense quick. When it gets to be too much, or when that front line starts to fail, I want everybody back at the barricade, guns ready. Now, hopefully by that point we'll have them thinning out enough that guns will be able to make a difference. The same cowboy raised his hand again. And if we don't, he asked. Then you swing with everything you got, Hammond said firmly. Because if they get through here, they're not going to stop until they get back to town. The men exchanged some concerned looks, but there was determination in their eyes. This was a job they couldn't fail. Okay, everybody knows what they're doing, the sergeant said. So let's get in position. Whittaker approached him with a machete in one hand, an axe in the other. Which one you want, Sarge? she asked. He examined them for a moment and then grabbed the axe. This will work just fine, he said, and gave it a couple of practice swings to get a feel for the weight of it. They turned towards the horde, which had finally tapered off at the back. The mass stretched for a couple hundred yards. Well, at least the conga line finally ended, he muttered. Whittaker took a deep breath. Still a lot more than I was hoping for, she said. Don't worry, he clapped her on the shoulder. We'll handle them. Oh, I know, she replied with a smirk. Just wasn't planning on having this strenuous of a workout today. Hammond chuckled and turned to Landry. Why don't you grab a few welcome gifts for them? he asked. With pleasure, the private replied with a grin, and jogged over to the gas pumps, picking up three of the Molotovs and rejoining the line. He handed one each over to his companions, and the trio all pulled out lighters, waiting for the horde to get within range. So, when you were clearing out the empties, Whitaker said, you didn't happen to find a full six-pack, did you? Hammond and Landry glanced at each other, grins wide on their faces. Oh, the latter drawled, exaggerating his tone. Nope, nothing at all. You're so full of shit, Whitaker replied, shaking her head. Yes, yes I am he declared. The horde reached a twenty-yard buffer, and the soldiers checked on the cowboys to make sure they were still standing fast. As the zombies shuffled a few yards closer, Hammond took a deep breath. Light em up! he bellowed. They lit the cloths and threw the three flaming bottles in unison into the crowd. Landry's went twenty yards deep, having given it everything he had, and the glass smashed on a zombie skull, sending a small fireball explosion ripping through the crowd. Whittaker's managed to hit the ground about ten yards deep, so the explosion was more muted, but within seconds a dozen or so ghouls were engulfed in flames. Hammond's was parallel to hers, hoping to make a small gap in the horde to buy them a few precious seconds, to smack down the ones in front. It cracked against a zombie's face, exploding with such force that it ripped the head of the corpse right off, sending tens of creatures around it ablaze. "'Warriors, get ready!' the sergeant barked and he and his soldiers gripped their weapons tightly, ready to do battle with the horde. The cowboys did the same, though their faces were a lot paler and full of trepidation. When the front edge of the mass reached the line, multiple strands of thick-cut barbed wire cut into their guts and chests as the rest pushed against their backs. The added weight caused the sharp edges to penetrate deeply into the decrepit flesh like butter. Hammond let out a yell and stepped up with an axe, swinging down hard and cracking the top of a skull. The zombie convulsed for a moment before slumping backwards and to the ground, falling free of the barbed wire. His attack got everybody moving, the soldiers and cowboys launching vicious attacks. The sledgehammers exploded heads like an M-80 in a cantaloupe. The axes cracked skulls and lobbed heads clean off at the neck. Machetes jabbed straight into eye sockets and caved in noses. With a fierce thirty-second barrage, the front line of the ghouls were pacified. Some of them crashed to the blood-slick pavement, while others remained upright, caught on the wire. The zombies behind them pressed forward, shoving their dispatched brethren through the wire, cutting the bodies in half. A few of the men had to step aside to avoid torsos landing on them. The second group was on them quickly, as the small holes from the Molotovs closed. Nine warriors, quickly splattered in crimson, continued to swing, smashing skulls and decapitating bodies. The battle continued for several minutes before they began to tire. Some of the cowboys, who had started off swinging as hard and as fast as they could, 
were down to a few well-paced swings every thirty seconds. This allowed the living zombies at the front to push through the barbed wire, cutting them in half and sending their still-chomping torsos behind the line. "'Breaking off the line!' Whittaker barked when she noticed the half-ghouls crawling towards them. She left her post and quickly stabbed the slithering creatures to end the threat. As she finished off the second one, she looked up and spotted several more near the end of the line, about ten yards from her. One of the cowboys wasn't paying attention, dancing in a rage-filled trance and swinging his axe as hard as he could. Whittaker opened her mouth to yell out, but it was too late. She watched helplessly as the ghoul latched onto his ankle, sinking its teeth into his calf. The cowboy screamed and dropped his axe, crumbling to the ground. He kicked at the zombie with his good leg, his boot eventually caving in its forehead. "'Sarge! We're breached!' Whittaker screamed. Hammond swung again, cracking another skull before looking down the line. Several zombies were being cut in half and landing on their side of the line, still alive. "'Whittaker! Clean up duty!' he barked. "'We hold this line as long as we can!' She drew her handgun and raced up and down the line, executing the ghouls on the ground as soon as they hit pavement. As she did this, the bitten cowboy struggled back to his feet, wincing as he put pressure on his wounded leg. He picked up his axe and began swinging again, each blow filled with rage. He flew into a frenzy, not bothering to pause or aim at all. At one point he smacked a zombie multiple times in the neck area, sending blood everywhere, but not quite decapitating the corpse. "'Get your shit together, man! Focus!' the cowboy beside him yelled. The wounded man stopped moving and took a deep breath, closing his eyes for a moment before bringing his axe down hard on the zombie's head. He adjusted his target to the next one, finally taking his time and dropping it in one go. His presence on the line helped, though the line itself did little at this point to stem the tide of the horde. Everyone in the centre was forced to take a step back as the thick barbed wire barricade started to give, stretching out in the centre. Once the zombies took a few steps, the high-pitched twang of metal snapping filled the air. Within seconds the ghouls were moving faster, pushing further and further in as the barbed wire snapped. Hammond, standing off to the gas station side, spotted this and turned to his men. "'Fall back positions!' he yelled. The cowboys broke the line, with two of them rushing over to get their wounded friend to help him run. They sprinted through the open area, which was about twenty yards and ducked under the next thicker line of wire. The soldiers darted over to the gas station, the boys going for the Molotovs. "'Whitaker, guard duty!' Hammond barked. She nodded. "'On it, Sarge!' she replied, and stopped about five yards away from the barricade, keeping her eyes trained on the outer edge of the wire line. Most of the ghouls stayed on the road, pushed in by the force of the mass behind them, but a few managed to shamble outside of the protective zone. She took out her assault rifle, checking her aim and squeezing off precise round after precise round, dropping the freed creatures. As she did this, the ghouls at the front of the line reached out for her, shoved forward under the weight of the blunding marching creatures behind them. In less than a minute, the entire cordoned-off area was jam-packed tight with the undead. Hammond and Landry approached the line, carrying multiple six-packs of Molotovs. The sergeant pulled out his lighter and began the assault. One after another, he lit and threw, creating a small fire pit that engulfed several zombies. He spread the bottles around, some at the front, some in the middle, and some as close as he could get to the rear. In a matter of minutes, the entire battlefield was filled with smoke and the unmistakable vile scent of burning rotted flesh. Hammond paused, looking down the road to see what they were dealing with. The line still stretched at least a hundred yards, all of them pushing forward, trying to get to the fresh meat at the other end. As the fire raged, Whittaker continued to fire sporadically, to keep the ghouls from overwhelming their position by going around the barbed wire. As she stopped to reload, somebody screamed for help from the cowboy line. "'Whittaker, hold!' he barked. "'Landry, get another volley ready to go!' He raced past the flaming horde, coming around to the front where the cowboys were battling with them. Flaming ghouls still moving and very agitated, were still being cut in half by the force of the horde and the barbed wire. Only this time they were on fire. The flames were intense, causing the cowboys a great deal of difficulty in delivering head strikes. They were forced to take several steps back and wait for the ghouls to be cut in two before stepping up to get them. Hammond shook his head. You're going to have to get in there, or this whole thing is going to fail! he bellowed. 
The flames are too intense, one of the cowboys yelled. Either get burned or get eaten, the sergeant replied. Weigh it! The cowboy took a deep breath and tightened his grip on his weapon. Get in there, boys! He let out a motivating yell and dove back into the fight. The others followed, delivering head strikes to the severed torsos first, then starting in on the burning creatures. Hammond watched as a few of them dropped their axes to the ground, as the heat from the fire burned them even through their work gloves. As he watched, the barbed wire began to bend in the middle, concerning him. Before he could think too hard on it, though, Landry whistled loudly, and the sergeant raced back over to him. When he reached him, his eyes widened, several dozen ghouls had been forced outside of the containment area at the metal posts, and were making their way towards the station. They were still about thirty yards away, but closing fast. "'We're not going to be able to hold this position much longer, Sarge,' Landry warned. Hammond clenched his jaw, thinking for a moment before grabbing a Molotov. He lit up a few and lobbed them one by one towards the creeping threat. The flames engulfed them quickly, but they kept coming. Whittaker continued to shoot and then stopped to reload. "'One mag left after this!' she yelled as she smacked another into her rifle. The fire on the ghouls in the pit was starting to have an impact, as significant portions of them collapsed to the ground. They were quickly replaced by a fresh batch, stepping onto the charred remains of their brethren. "'How many Molotovs we got left?' Hammond asked. Landry inspected his supply. Eight, he replied. The sergeant looked over to Whittaker, who was furiously firing, barely able to keep them at bay. He took a deep breath, grimacing. "'Fall back to the barricade!' he yelled. It was a difficult decision, but one that had to be made. She fired a few more times before breaking away. Landry grabbed the last handful of Molotovs, and they ran. When they came around the corner, they saw the cowboys fighting desperately against the wall of flesh. The barbed wire was really starting to stretch, already weakened by the combination of the first wave and the flames. It was on the verge of giving way as the second wave approached. "'Get to the barricade!' Hammond bellowed. Most of the cowboys broke away, carrying their wounded man along with them. One of them stayed, continuing to hack away while the others retreated. The sergeant rushed over, grabbing him by the back of the shirt and pulling. "'Let's move! Now!' he yelled. The cowboy tried to wrench free. "'But they'll get through!' he protested. "'They're getting through regardless!' Hammond grunted. "'Now move!' The cowboy reluctantly retreated along with the others. They made it to the makeshift barricade on the road, which was about thirty yards away. The handful of cars and sheet metal was flimsy and barely covered the whole road, but it was all they had. Landry and Whittaker jumped on top of the vehicles, looking back towards the horde. They watched as the zombies pushed into the holding area, pressing against the barbed wire. Several of them slides through, the weight against them too much for the fragile rotting bodies to withstand. "'How are we looking?' Hammond asked from the ground. Landry shook his head. "'About half-past fucked, Sarge,' he replied. "'Could you be a little more vague, Private?' Hammond snapped. "'Line isn't nearly as long, maybe about sixty yards,' Whittaker cut in. "'Got a few dozen wandering around the pumps at the gas station, and the rest are pressing on.' "'Ammo?' the sergeant asked. She let out a deep breath. Forty, maybe forty-five shots,' she replied. "'Landry?' he pressed. Sixty, if I'm lucky.' the private replied. "'Gets us a tenth of the way there,' Hammond replied with a sigh. He turned back to the cowboys, all exhausted and nursing the burns on their hands. A few couldn't even grip their weapons any more due to the pain. "'You boys did good, but there's nothing more you can do here,' he said as he approached them. One of the cowboys hissed but shook his head. "'We're not abandoning this post,' he grunted. "'The town is counting on us. We'll figure something out,' the sergeant replied. But you need to tend to your man and your wounds. You're not going to do anybody any good trying to fight in your condition. The man was reluctant, but eventually nodded in agreement, glancing at his comrades. Let's get loaded up, boys, he said. The others looked defeated, shoulders slumping, but nobody argued. They moved the wounded man back into the back of a pickup truck before piling in themselves. They headed back to town, just a short ride up the road. Hammond looked at the wire barricade, and, as if on cue, it snapped, sending several injured zombies at the front tumbling to the ground. They struggled to get back up as the other ghouls swarmed over them, all headed forward. 
Shit, Hammond grunted. Landry, light him up! The privates lit what they had left and started throwing. The bottles splashed down on the ghouls at the front, slowing them and setting several more on fire. The soldiers stood at the barricade, staring death in the face. With hundreds of zombies still standing and working their way towards them, they contemplated their next move, knowing their time was short. Open to ideas, Hammond said. Retreat into town, Whitaker replied. See if we can't spread the horde around and take them out in small groups. The sergeant shook his head. Last resort, he said. We don't have the time, and all it takes is one runner to fuck the whole operation. Landry stared over at the horde, fixated on the gas station. There were a few dozen ghouls around the pumps and in the parking lot, but the majority of them ignored it, instead moving through the kill zone they set up. How pissed do you think Andrew would be if the gas station didn't make it? Landry asked. Whittaker sighed. I don't like where this is going, she drawled. Not my first choice either, but it could work, Landry mused. Hammond crossed his arms. What are you thinking? Take out the ones around the pumps, unleash every nozzle to flood the roadway, and set it off, the private explained. If we time it right, we might be able to hit the emergency pump switch off before the whole thing goes up. And if we don't, Whittaker asked. At least we won't have to worry about Andrew yelling at us, Landry quipped. She rolled her eyes and then locked her gaze on the zombies making their way closer, now within twenty yards as the flaming ghouls dropped and fizzled out. If we're going to do it, we gotta do it now, she urged. Let's go, Hammond confirmed. The three soldiers readied their guns, leaping down from the barricade and running as hard as they could towards the gas station. The zombies covered the majority of the road, but the side of it was mostly clear. They reached by the outstretched arms of the ghouls, heading towards the gas station that was now thirty yards away. When they reached fifteen yards of the parking lot, they stopped and took aim. Cut him down! Hammond barked. The trio unleaded on the ghouls in the parking lot, dropping ten in a matter of seconds. As Landry and Whittaker continued to fire, the sergeant looked back at the mass of creatures they'd run past. They were closing fast, about fifteen yards away. The zombies in the parking lot continued to head towards them, the privates doing what they could to thin them out. Hammond turned away from the creeping horde. We gotta go, he barked. Whitaker, cover us! They sprinted towards the pumps, which still had nearly a dozen ghouls within five yards of them. Landry fired as he ran, hitting a few closest to them. He and Hammond made a direct line for the pumps while Whitaker took up position a few yards away. She aimed carefully, selecting her targets carefully, as they were close. She kept the coast clear as the two of them grabbed the nozzles, stretching them out as far as they could go. "'Go for distance!' Hammond yelled. The two of them hit their triggers while arcing the nozzles up, sending a forceful stream of fuel out about ten yards, landing short of the horde that was headed their way. They continued this for several moments as Whittaker continued to pump round after round into the zombies. "'Clear!' she yelled as she secured the immediate area. Get the rest of the nozzles going, Hammond called. Put them on auto. She nodded and leapt into action, grabbing the remaining few nozzles and hooking the release so that a steady stream of gas flowed from it. She set them on the ground and puddles began to flow. This went on for a few moments before they were forced to abandon their position due to the ghouls getting too close. Get to the store, Hammond cried. The trio ran to the entrance of the building. Landry and Whittaker bursting inside to do a sweep of the place. It was relatively small, with only two aisles of snacks and other small items stacked on metal display racks. They each took one. Clear, Landry announced. Whittaker nodded. Clear, she added. Gonna check the back. She rushed into the small storeroom, which was dark with a bit of movement in the far corner. Without waiting on confirmation, she pulled the trigger a few times, catching a worn-down ghoul in the head and dropping it. She rushed to the back door, kicking it open, and burst outside. She scanned the area that led to open desert terrain, with no threat in sight. Landry moved back to the front, standing in the doorway. Hundreds of ghouls poured into the parking lot, their feet soaked in gasoline as they marched towards the building, fifteen yards from the entrance. He looked over at Hammond, standing at the corner of the building with his hand on the emergency pump shut-off button. "'Call it, Sarge!' Landry bellowed. Hammond glanced at the parking lot, seeing the gas covered nearly the entire area, 
even getting to the entrance of the building. You wait until they're right on top of you to drop the light, he said firmly. Landry nodded as the two of them turned back to the hoard, and he pulled out his lighter, flicking it on and holding it, waiting. The ghouls were five yards away, and he nodded to the sergeant. They both acted at the same moment, Hammond hitting the emergency stop button as Landry let go of the lighter. Both men quickly ducked to safety, Hammond running around the side of the building and Landry ducking inside. He barely reached the first aisle, diving to the side as the lighter touched down on the puddle of gasoline. It took a moment for the vapors to ignite, but they did. It set off a massive blast. Flames quickly spread to every inch of fuel, sending a massive fireball into the air, engulfing everything in its path. The shockwave from the blast blew out the windows, sending shards of glass into the building and knocking over one of the metal display racks, sending snacks down onto Landry. The heat was intense, and he could feel it even from underneath his makeshift hiding spot. The moans from the massive horde of zombies quickly faded as they were covered from head to toe in extreme fire. Landry's heart skipped a beat when he heard footsteps on the broken glass. You gotta be fucking kidding me, he muttered, and peeked through a small gap in the metal, watching as a handful of blazing ghouls shambled inside. He remained quiet while readying his handgun, which was the only one of his weapons he could really move at the moment. The zombies heard the movement verged on him, smacking their flaming hands on the metal rack, sending tiny little fireballs into the crevice. Knowing his cover was blown, Landry bellowed, Whitaker! A moment later the room filled with gunfire as she came around the corner, opening fire on the ghoul standing over him. She cleared them out quickly, and then called out, Landry! Under here! he cried. Whitaker rushed over and lifted the display rack up enough for him to slide out. You okay? she asked. I'm good, he assured her. The two of them looked out the front of the building that was completely in ruins. Their entire field of vision was full of nothing but flames and writhing bodies, like some vision of hell. There were a few corpses still standing, but they quickly fell, eviscerated by the flames. As they burned, the emergency fire suppression system kicked in by the gas pumps. A giant white cloud quickly covered the area directly under the canopy, smothering the flames, at least somewhat. The two soldiers held their breaths, thinking that the suppression might spare some of the ghouls, but as the smoke began to clear, their fears were unfounded. The only creatures still standing were at the far edge of the horde, standing near the barricade they'd abandoned. "'No more than a dozen of those things left,' Landry said, letting out a deep breath. "'I think we can manage that.' "'Let's get Hammond and take care of them,' Whitaker replied, and looked around. "'Wait, where the hell's the Sarge?' Landry pointed outside. "'The shut-off button was on the side of the building,' he explained. He's probably around back. Back exit is clear. Come on, she said, and waved for him to follow her out. They found Hammond leaning up against the brick, breathing heavily. You all right there, Sarge? Whitaker asked. He nodded. Yeah, I'm good, he huffed. That heat was intense. No kidding, Landry added, pointing to his shirt to show off the singe marks on it from the mini fireballs. We good out there? Hammond asked. Whitaker nodded. Just a little mop-up duty she said. Let's get to it then, the sergeant said, pushing off of the wall. The trio came around the side of the building, making sure to stay in the desert terrain as they walked towards their last remaining zombies. Each of them pulled out their handguns, not wanting to take any chances at that point. Quick and clean, Hammond said firmly. The soldiers nodded, and the three converged on their last enemies, taking them out with precise headshots like angels of death. Finally the battlefield fell silent with nothing standing. There were a few smouldering corpses writhing on the ground, lacking the strength to get back up and be a threat. As the trio looked over the carnage, a truck raced up the highway. They turned and watched as Andrew got out and walked over to them. The cowboy tried to speak, but his mouth simply hung open as he surveyed the situation. His eyes widened and his face went pallid as he took in the sheer amount of bodies in the road. You all right there, bud? Landry asked. I've just... Andrew rasped, clearing his throat. I've never... Yeah, we're right there with you, Landry said gently. New one even for us. The cowboy nodded. Is the threat over? He rasped. Pretty sure, Hammond replied with a nod. We're going to keep an eye on the interstate, make sure none of the others were attracted by the noise we made. 
but we just might be in the clear. Whittaker waved a hand. But as you can see, she said, some of these things are still moving, so I don't recommend going to the gas station any time soon. It's a shame we had to lose it, Andrew trailed off, and then his eyes widened and he raised his palms. Oh, but, I mean, please don't take that as me being ungrateful for what you did, he amended, speaking rapidly. I just... I'm not criticizing. I just... I just spoke a thought. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to come off as rude there. No need to apologize, Hammond cut in. That station is important to your town, so it would have been the first thing out of my mouth as well. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder. That being said, I hit the emergency shut-off button before we burned it down, so the fuel in the underground tank should still be good. Might have to get creative to get it out, but it's still there. Andrew nodded. We're a resourceful bunch, he drawled. I'm sure we can figure it out when the time comes. How is your injured man doing? Whittaker asked. He shook his head. The doc did a battlefield amputation to hopefully limit the spread of the infection, but we're not hopeful, he admitted. Has that ever worked? Landry asked, raising an eyebrow. Andrew shrugged. Never had to try it before, he said. He suggested it, and we figured we might as well try. Whatever the result, we'll be sure to pass it along to Clara. We appreciate that, Hammond said, and wish him the best. Andrew turned back to the charred horde. So what now? he asked. We need to rest, the sergeant admitted. Then in the morning, we'll be on our way to go get our friend in El Paso. The cowboy nodded. Well, once you get settled, come by City Hall, he suggested. I'll have my older sister cook you a proper meal, and I'll pull together some supplies that might be useful for you. We don't have a lot, but you did a lot for this town today, and I'm going to make sure you see our gratitude. We appreciate that, Hammond said. We'll be by in a couple hours. The cowboy gave them a wave and headed back to his truck, heading back to town. The trio of soldiers stood there, looking over their handiwork. It took everything we had to take out a couple thousand of those things, Landry murmured. How in the hell are they going to deal with a million? Whittaker shook her head. I have no clue, she admitted. This is just overwhelming. Lucky for us, it's not our problem, the sergeant cut in. We've done our part for this fight, and now we have to focus on the bigger picture. Getting Mathis back, and with any luck, putting that bastard Tiago in his place once and for all. Landry and Whittaker nodded in firm, silent agreement, the three of them watching the interstate intently, hoping beyond hope that their fighting for the day was at an end. Chapter 9 Leon looked at the monitor of his satellite computer, watching another few thousand zombies go in both directions at the latest highway turnoff. He zoomed in on the smoke rising from the south, smiling widely at the sight of a giant mass of charred bodies. That looks like a mess, Ethel said from over his shoulder. Glad I don't have to clean that up. Leon nodded. That's where Hammond and the others are, he said. Honestly, I'm surprised it's that small of a mess, she quipped and headed over to the coffee pot, filling up a large thermos. She grabbed it with two small stacking cups and set them down beside him. Trenton told me that the cartel left for the day. Figured out might want to pay Rogers a visit. He might be going stir-crazy in his hiding spot. He smirked up at her. You trying to get rid of me, Ethel? he asked playfully. Why would I want to get rid of my underling? she asked. It's not like you keep me here against my will. I just figured it might do you some good. Instead of staring at all that doom and gloom you can't do anything about. He chuckled. This is true. He flicked off the monitor and stood up, stretching before grabbing the thermos and cups. You have a good evening, ma'am. I'll see you in the morning. Bright and early, she replied with a smile. I'll be here. He left the command center, strolling south through town towards the school. As he approached the bridge over the drainage ditch, there was an impressive-looking barricade blocking the path. Two cars were flipped over on their sides and reinforced with metal on the other side. Trenton sat on the side of the bridge as Leon strolled up. This is looking pretty good, Leon said. Trenton shrugged. Yeah, not sure how much good it's gonna do, he admitted, but we're gonna give it a shot. So, Leon looked back and forth. How do I get around it? Oh, sorry, Trenton replied, shaking his head. I had to take the ladder down to reinforce the base. He stood up and pulled a ladder from the ground, setting it up in the center. 
Leon climbed up, getting to the top and noting the platform at the top with several metal spears piled up and ready. "'Looks like we're going full medieval with this,' he said. "'It's strong, it works, and it doesn't need to reload,' Trenton explained. "'Can't think of a better way to fight these things.' Leon cocked his head. "'I don't know. Tomahawk missiles? Tanks? Napalm?' he joked as he secured himself on the platform. "'I'll add that to the shopping list next time we make a run.' Trenton said, chuckling. Leon laughed. I'm running low on scotch, too. Just saying, he added. Consider it done, Trenton said with a wave. Have a good night. Leon waved back and then hopped down the other side. He walked the several blocks to the school, surveying the fortified houses with boarded-up windows, spikes on the front porch, and a whole host of low-cost, low-effectiveness protections. I hope to God we can stop these things from getting here he thought, swallowing hard. Because if we can't, this is going to be a massacre. We just aren't prepared for an assault of this magnitude. When he reached the school, it looked more like a fortress than an institute of learning. There were numerous ditches dug out and trapped with spikes, the windows were secured with boards, and there was a thick sandbag barricade in front of the door. This is a little better, he thought as he climbed the ladder over the dirt bags. But if we get thousands of those things in town— this might become a tomb instead of a safe haven. He hopped over the side and walked inside, surveying the interior. It was set up like a battle zone. There were melee weapons scattered at every window, with safe zones and medical areas. Several civilians walked about, checking supplies and defenses. But if we go down, he thought, it's going to be fighting. All of the people in this town are survivors, and with any luck, we'll still be survivors once this is done. He allowed himself a glimmer of hope, and took a deep breath as he entered the gym, looking for the far corner where Roger's hiding spot was. He approached it, and then did a playful, shave-and-a-haircut knock on it. There was no answer, and he tried again. Still, no answer. So he took a deep breath. "'Everybody's gone home for the night,' he called. "'Just me, you, and a canister of fresh coffee.' A few moments passed before the sound of unlatching locks echoed through the gym. The secret door opened, revealing Rogers behind it. "'Ethel just doesn't want me to go without, does she?' he drawled. Leon grinned. "'No, she does not,' he replied, holding up the cups. "'Well, come on in,' Rogers replied, stepping aside with a flourish. "'Let me give you the grand tour.' Leon stepped inside and looked around. The space looked like a cheap studio apartment, with a mattress on the floor, a kerosene heater, some battery-powered lighting— and a stack of books sitting beside a weapon stash. "'If you were twenty, Leon drawled. "'Eh, twenty-five years younger. I'd swear this was your first bachelor pad.' Rogers barked a laugh. "'Shit, man, I ain't that old,' he quipped. "'You sure?' Leon shot back, and they shared a chuckle as they approached the small table in the corner. He set down the cups and unscrewed the cap on the thermos, pouring them each a hot cup. "'So, how was it out there?' Rogers asked. Leon sighed, leaning back with his full cup. Don't know if we're getting out of this one, he admitted. I've been away for two days and it's already falling apart out there without me, Rogers joked. Afraid so, man, Leon replied with a smirk. The detective shrugged. Looks like I might have to emerge sooner than I would have liked, he said. Nah, man, you stay put, his friend said with a wave of his hand. You still have book reports to do for me. Well, I got a couple of them done, Rogers said, motioning to the stack. How about a little quid pro quo? Give me a real report about how it's going out there. Leon took a long sip of his coffee, his face falling from the fun banter. It's bad, he said quietly. We've only been able to divert maybe ten, fifteen thousand of them from the horde. Rogers sobered as well, taking in a sharp breath and then taking a long sip of the hot brew. On the plus side... Rodriguez has a plan to get Hammond and his crew into El Paso tomorrow. Leon continued. They know where Mathis is, and they're going to go get him. The detective nodded. And Tiago? He's trying to orchestrate a shot for them, Leon said. Rogers swallowed hard. They damn well better hit this time, he muttered. Yeah, no shit, his friend agreed. Especially after what we're going to do to Angel. The detective perked up. You got a plan? he asked. Leon nodded. Working on one. Care to share? Rogers pressed, setting down his mug. Nah, his friend replied with a smirk. 
Got to keep a little of the mystery. The detective scoffed. You're such a tease, he said. They sipped their brew in silence for a few moments, and then he sighed. Man, how did it come to this? A month ago I was at the top of my game, living life to its fullest. Now I'm living in a high school gymnasium. Man, how do you think I feel? Leon drawled. A month ago I was a high-ranking military intelligence officer. Now I'm hanging out in my friend's high school gymnasium bachelor pad. You ain't the only one to fall from grace. They shared a laugh, savoring the moment of levity instead of doom-filled moments. Well, man, I'm clucked out for the night, Leon finally said. You got a deck of cards or something in this joint? Rogers grinned. Yeah, I think I can scare one up, he said, and reached for a storage container beneath the table, rummaging around inside. He pulled out a deck of cards and a bottle of whiskey, unscrewing the cap and pouring a few dollops into each coffee cup. Leon lifted his mug and shrugged. Eh, what the hell, I'm close enough to Irish. He took a sip and then hissed. Man, that is good stuff. So, what's your game? Rogers asked as he shuffled the cards. Kind of partial to gin rummy myself, Leon replied. And at his friend's raised eyebrow he shrugged. What? Rogers shook his head. You just kind of struck me as a poker player, he admitted. What can I say? Leon asked. My mama appreciated the wholesome classics. All right, the detective replied. Gin rummy it is. He finished shuffling and dealt the cards, as Leon picked up the whiskey bottle and added a little more to each cup. They settled into their game in companionable silence, focusing intently on their cards and doing everything they could to push out the constant thoughts of the creeping death continuously heading their way. The End Up next, with only one major choke point remaining between the Horde and El Paso, Survivors make their way to Van Horn to set up defences in Creeping Death Part 4. <laughs>